Hello and welcome to another session of Aw Academy. Today we're going to be talking about Aut DHD <laughs> or the experience of, um, of, of being autistic as well as being an ADHD -er or having attention differences. There we go, we've got it on the screen there. My name is Annette um, and I am autistic and I also um, I'm an ADHD or I have attention differences. And I'm gonna give you a physical description of myself right now. Um, I am blonde and I have my hair up in a very messy bun. I've not brushed my hair today and I was not allowed to brush my hair <laughs> before the session. Um, I am white and a uh, middle-aged person with blue eyes and an overall space. I've got a beige uh, kind of V-neck uh, top on and I'm sitting in a white room with a bookshelf behind me. Um, I also have um, quite a, a amazing autistic and ADHD ears here today and we've got um, Sai would you mind giving a description of yourself? Uh, and uh, Northern Naughty says, I'm on the third floor of a bungalow, specifically the basement. I'm wearing a striped polka dotted inside out pair of, of one sock, <laughs> a dark white tank tee and shortened long hair. Also not PDA. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sai. Um, I'm just gonna go as it says. So we've got Ben here as well. Ben, could you give a physical description? Uh, and Ben says, person using a potato filter wearing a gaming headset in front of a purple background. And um, yes, we uh, support autistic people who um, uh, don't want to be on camera and use filters instead. At Academy, we embrace anxious autistic people using filters to give them confidence to appear on screen. Um, okay, so we also have Libby here. Um, Libby, could you give a physical description of yourself? Uh, yep, I'm another white person with dark hair and I have a filter on though not as much as Ben's where it's like an octopus on my head. It's fabulous. You also have those stripes, so they're kind of a, what are they, a oh, Viking? I think it's like a blush. Is it a blush? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, it's fabulous and I love the, the grumpy octopus. Um, that's great. Thanks, Libby. And also, Victoria, um, could you give a physical description of yourself? Yeah. Um, a white, older, middle-aged person wearing glasses with very, very grey, long, straight hair. Uh, wearing, oh, I don't, can't remember colours, greeny top, um, sat on a pale pink sofa with a white background and a painting in the background. Thank you very much, uh, Victoria, and uh, welcome everybody. I I'm quite excited about talking about this today because for me, um, I have been obsessed with being autistic since I discovered I was autistic um, in 2013, I think, and did a PhD on it. Um, that's how obsessive I was. <laughs> And it's my special interest. But um, I also, along the way, um, discovered that I was an ADHD -er as well. So I know a lot more about being autistic than I do that. Um, so I'm going to be learning today. This is really an impromptu session um, with all of us from the Academy. And there's actually going to be another session, uh, kind of an official panel on um, ADHD years um, on the 31st of August. And that will be um, quite informative when it comes to exactly what the DSM says um, ADHD is and, and how people kind of identify with that and not identify with that. So this is kind of a bit more informal about what it's like to be um, autistic and an ADHD. -er. Um, so I guess the next thing to ask people, because we all know that we're autistic and we're all, we've all been on Academy Lives quite a bit, is when did you discover that you were an ADHD -er? Um Yeah, let's see. Oh, actually we've got a comment here, so I'll just read that as well. Hello everyone, what does being both autistic and ADHD mean to you if you experience both? So that's good. 
Um, yeah, so if anybody, does anybody want to start or should I just go in order that I see people? Victoria. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was, I sort of suspected um, the detention differences a couple of years ago. Um, I vehemently denied it for quite a while because I didn't truly understand it. I thought it was just about sort of being hyperactive um, outwardly and I wasn't at all because I'm quite sedentary if anyone knows me. Um, but then when it was through connecting with the community, the autistic community and learning a lot more about it and then suddenly realising that there was the the attention differences did play more of a role. And a year ago, I was formally identified with, with ADHD. Great. Thanks, Victoria. And I think that's um, quite interesting to talk about because I think uh, that I had very similar experience. You know, I, I that, you know, said, no, no, I'm not ADHD. I, I'm not like my friends that are ADHD. Um, I don't I don't speak a lot, actually. I'm usually the quiet person. <laughs> um, you know, I and I it was that hyperactivity is the stereotypes that the hyperactivity um, needed to be, you know, that behavior needed to be seen to be um, an ADHD -er. And it wasn't till really started talking to Chloe a lot about it. She's like, you totally are. Um, and I think Melissa, is it Melissa Simmons? Hopefully Chloe will correct me if I'm wrong, but they did a session on um, being ADHD and they talked about their experience and that the, it's hyperactivity of the mind, um, not necessarily of the body. And I think I totally identify with that. Um, yeah, so I discovered kind of along um, my autistic discovery journey um, and talking to the community about it and realizing that the stereotypes about um, um, ADHD, ADHD or attention differences actually wasn't um, something that um, were true or and that you know I could identify as that. Um, does anybody else want to talk about their experience when they discovered? I think really this year really I've been starting to accept that I'm very much ADHD. It was a very strongly associate myself with the autistic experience. So the more things about ADHD I've been seeing, I'm just saying, that's autistic experience. Why? So it's been very confusing. So obviously now I'm like, no, I'm very much ADHD and autistic. And I also, I do need to, I'm not, I haven't got a formal diagnosis, but it's something I do need to do. Because there's a lot of, I have a lot of struggles with it. And a lot of it has come down to the ADHD. Yeah, and it's really interesting because I think there's a the array of people here. So we've got, I think Victoria is formally diagnosed, Libby is formally diagnosed and got your diagnosis. Well, you talk about it in a minute. Well, around when you were autistic, you found out you were autistic. Um, I'm I'm not formally diagnosed, but I'm diagnosed with like everything else. <laughs> autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic. Um, yeah. Um, which is not everything else. There's lots of other things. <laughs> That's the EDS. I don't know, you know, all the things, which there's also going to be a session on Academy about um, why autistic people have all the things. Um, and I think a lot of us identify with that here <laughs> as well. Um, and actually, yeah, one of the things that I was talking about in relation to the formal uh, kind of symptoms that maybe NHS might have up about ADHD or, or the descriptors or the behavioral descriptors, what you can see from the outside. And one of them being um, kind of, I'm just looking here, uh, oh, well, excessive talking, talking, basically, talking over people. Or And I, I noticed that actually all of us here actually don't don't do that to a certain extent. Our brains might be going 500 miles an hour, but we don't um, actually, or at least mine is, um, I don't actually um, speak all of what I have inside of my brain, if that makes sense. Um, does yeah, anybody I else want to formulate yeah. what's, I, yeah, my thoughts are too quick to verbalize. And I think that as I've got older, that's got worse. 
Yeah, and I also find it very hard. It takes me much longer to process what other people are th saying. So usually I'm quite far behind in the conversation and my brain is thinking about something they've said, you know, maybe five minutes ago and going around and around about that, but trying also to listen to other people. So yeah, it is quite difficult in that way. Um, Libby or Ben, do you want to talk about um, when you kind of found out that you were an ADHD -er? Ah, Ben. Ben says, realized I might be ADHD last April. It was because I only started my university dissertation in the last two weeks of my one month extension. Oh, that sounds like me. <laughs> and it was at that point I had a light bulb moment about being ADHD. And now looking back, I can see attention differences at the play at play along with other things associated with ADHD, such as rejection uh, as rejection sensitivity. Um, yeah, thank you, Ben. That's awesome. Um, and yeah, I mean, procrastination <laughs> um, is and is, is very good at that. I'm oh, very good I, at things I, off. I am a superhero at it. <laughs> To the point where my PhD supervisor describes me as an ostrich because I, I put my head in the sand. PDA. I thought it was my PDA where I was just being very demand avoidant, but it, it overlaps a lot with the ADHD. Yeah, and I think also um, in relation to executive functioning, obviously, um, kind of being able to focus, being able to activate yourself into action, um, organizing and prioritizing things is quite hard um, when you're autistic and ADHD. I don't know. Um, Libby, if you want, did you talk about why or when you discovered that you were an AD, ADHD? -er? Yeah, so um, mine was kind of backwards to like my experience of um, finding out I was autistic because that from that I was kind of more through the community and self-identity before I went with the formal diagnosis. Um, but with ADHD, it, it was a mistake on the GP's part. So I, um, it, it was kind of surprising. Um, and so after I got the diagnosis, I then looked more into it. And did you identify with it right away? Yes, I've, I've always identified with the common not being able to pay attention kind of thing because um, I always had that throughout school. Uh, but again, I was confused about because of the stereotype of being hyper movement and talking and stuff, which I don't do massively. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because I don't do it, but I'm sitting here with the rubber band twisting it around my fingers. <laughs> so I, you know, to a certain extent, I don't have the hyperactivity, but I do, and I see. I guess I always saw that as stimming. Um, but I wonder if you guys uh, notice that. It's usually quite small for me, but I'm always moving. Yeah, um, my leg is going crazy at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, I really noticed that I just flew to Australia and it's a 24 hour flight and I didn't really connect it before, but I have to sit in the aisle seat because for me to sit in the middle seat or the, the seat by the window means that I can't move when I need to move. And for me not to be able to move is torture. It also um, means it's, it's visually under stimulating for me. You can't see other things going on. I'm just, Backed into a corner. Yeah. I can't see anything. Yeah. Although uh, normally in a restaurant, I want to be in a corner because then, then I'm safe. But for some reason on an airplane, I have to be on the aisle and I get up like to go to the bathroom about 500 if times. If I'm at home, I like to be in the corner, like in my bed or something. I like to be in the corner because that feels safe. But if I'm out somewhere, then I almost like need to feel like I can escape. Yes, definitely. Does anybody else have that experience? I'm just interested. I think um, I've, yeah, my foot is constantly always jigging, but it's very, I think I've learned over the years to sort of suppress that and not. So it's almost now 
having I've sort of stopped suppressing that sort of so much and now notice more the movements of not being able in it but it's very very subtle it's not that obvious yeah and I think that's so important because I think as autistic people and late diagnosed autistic people we have masked um, to protect mm. ourselves uh, how we experience the world and that's how we move as well and that's stimming um, so we have very small stims you know I used to write on my finger but it was something that nobody would notice so for me there is always movement now that I think about it you know always um, yeah I think but... about it is the need for stimulation and all so yeah. I would be doing th and I need that constant um, input of information so I would be counting the letters and words and stuff like that and also suppressing the movement um, to the point where my body would be tense trying to keep myself still but then you get to the point you don't notice that on anymore but it accounted for a lot of sort of aches and joints and things like that from the level of tension of trying to keep still. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's interesting because Kate B uh, um, says pretty much everything you're saying and that applies to me. Um, and that's really interesting as well, you know, that, that it speaks to other people. Um, I mean, sleeping as well. I'm the, the most restless sleeper in the world. Like I can't lay still for more than about... <laughs> five seconds before I'm tossing and turning and moving and trying to get comfortable. Um, so we've got Pedro, Carlos, uh, see, I'm going to pronounce everything wrong. Apes? I, that's probably wrong. I've seen a lot of aughts, um, autists, sorry, autists, I remember dyslexic, um, saying they're also ADHD -ers. Being a recent self-diagnosed autistic, how can I know if I'm ADHD considering that physical activity doesn't cut it? Um, thanks. Well, I think probably one of the first things you could do is just do the screening, uh, kind of the official ADHD or screening test. It's not very long. <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, the one that we have for uh, autistic is huge and long and takes forever, but this, this one's actually um, doable because I absolutely can't stand doing forms in general. But um, I don't know if we could put that at um, possibly in the chat at some point that might be good for people to check. Um, but one of the things that um, I thought was interesting was I read an article by Michelle Shara, Sarah, Sarah, Michelle Sarah it was written in 2019 called autism and ADHD neurological cousins. Um, and it's on neuroplastic. And I don't know if we could put that um, link at some point, if anybody wants to read that. Um, that would be great. And they kind of came up with, because what they were saying was that a lot of the official kind of symptoms, um, like what we're talking about, that, that hyperactivity that you have to be moving constantly and that has to be visible for you to be an ADHD -er, um, is actually behavior that people can see from the outside, not what it's like to experience um, um, being an ADHD -er and being autistic at the same time. Um, there we go. Yay. And um, they came up with like six kind of um, uh, topics or uh, kind of examples of that. And, and, and they talked about how executive functioning is really at the core of it, um, which I think is totally key um, to our experience um, as autistic people and um, ADHDers. Um, they talked about the first thing was activation. So being able to organize prioritize and activate yourself to work. So if you have trouble getting started, um, I mean, that also relates to autistic inertia and it is very difficult to kind of untangle all these things, all these, uh, you know, neurodivergencies uh, and say, is this the autism or is this, is this autistic or is this um, ADHD? But I think the more you're within the community and, um, talk to other people about this, it, it does become a little bit clearer, um, but it can take time. I don't know what you guys think, but um, for me, even as a PhD student, being able to organize myself is just impossible. <laughs> I mean, I did, the best thing in the world is an online calendar that somebody else invites you to meetings because if I create the meeting, I'll usually do it incorrectly because I'm dyslexic. Um, 
But if other people invite you to the meeting and it's there in my calendar, I would actually go to go there. So, um, you know, organizing for me and it's it is interesting and I want you guys to um, talk about your experience as well. But prioritizing, it's hard because I, I think and once again, it's neurodivergences, but as an autistic person, I see the whole I see everything and I can't decide what's the most important thing. I can't even write notes because I write notes. I will write down everything people say or the best I can. And I can't think in my brain while someone's talking to me what the most important thing is or how I can shorten it or make it into something that can just be a note, if that makes sense. So I just do it all. That's, that's, <laughs> conflict. that's the conflict I have with the ADHD and the autistic where I need structure and organization but like if a workspace offers too much information it's just just overwhelming for me yeah i need i need a simple clean organized thing so that i can work but i'm not simple and organized <laughs> and <laughs> clean and it's a it's a bit of a paradox i totally well, agree <laughs> um Oh, so Kate B, uh, so I get around my um, executive functioning, I think EF, they're saying, uh, issues by keeping checklists for everything, but that doesn't help with the getting started and actually doing something on my list. Um, yeah, and I do have that problem of making a list, but it ends up being like everything I have to do in my life, um, you know, <laughs> which doesn't help with the prioritization. And uh, yeah, uh, and they've said, yes, the note taking, and yeah, that's Kate B. Uh, Yes, the note taking. I write everything down and process it later. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Pedro Carlos um, says, I have just described, you have just described me. Write it all. <laughs> oh, that's good to hear. I what about you? Write it all and read it all with the hope that something will actually stick. Just just going back to the movement earlier, Ben's comment. Oh, yes. Did I miss it? Okay. Yeah. Ben says, I cannot sit with my feet on the floor. I'm sitting right now with one foot on the desk and the other bent on my chair. And I am constantly moving positions. So I can't stay in the same position for too long. It feels or it feels wrong. I totally, I've got one foot crossed and touching my other leg and another foot on the, on the, the foot of my chair so I can move the chair. <laughs> I totally get I'm, that. I'm, I'm always. Complete, I'm in a completely different place to where I'm be, so it's very well overwhelming to be honest, because I can't do what I normally do. I would normally be sitting back in my chair and with my feet up on the uh, puffy thing, and it's swing to swingy chair as well, so I can swing around, put my legs on the bed. I can do all the movement that I normally do, but I can't do that now. That must so, be frustrating. Well, you it can is, always I, just. I literally don't know, don't know what to do. <laughs> you can always just get up, you know. <laughs> we don't mind. We're all ADHDers here, so it's totally fine for you to stand up and talk, or or you know, uh, pace. We're totally fine. Jess Jess Glenley says, "I'm always moving, but for me, this is about a combination of autism and." Um, uh, and I'm just going to see EDS because I can't pronounce it. I always pronounce it wrong, but. Um, Elder Zoltan, yeah, Elder Daniels. I don't have the organization and attention characteristics of ADHD. That's interesting. Yes, and you know it is very complicated. I am also uh, EDS, so super flexible. Um, and for me, uh, sitting kind of scrunched up or having my feet also helps me with my proprioception. So knowing where my body is in space. So it is really um, difficult to kind of unpick all these things. Um, I think. In relation to that so and yeah activating um getting ourselves to actually do work um that is something i think i think we can all relate to because we've all talked about it before <laughs> yes livy's shaking their head um you know the kind of techniques that i do is is say that i'm going to do it badly um <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, for me, uh, getting started means I'm going to fail. Um, but also, you know, I'm just going to work for five minutes because I can do that. Um, and I'll time myself for five minutes to do that. 
Um, and then I'll get stuck in and the autistic part of me will kind of start to focus. Um, but that depends on uh, my mood and my emotions as well, I think, um, in that in that moment. What about you guys? I struggle with timers um, because that creates a demand. That's an expectation. That's a pressure. And I cannot take that or abide it. And I think there's part of me that really, really wants and needs that structure, desperately wants those routines, but then absolutely objects to it or takes that much energy to get myself to do them, but then can't maintain them. So the slightest break in routine and it goes and that's yeah. it, me gone with it. Yeah, definitely. And I always kind of feel like I'm on a tightrope between that kind of need for structure and routine and the demand avoidance of those things um, when I do put them in place. Um, and yeah, you're either, you know, yeah, you're, it's so easy to fall off that tightrope. Yeah. And I also, um, I always relied on leaving everything to the last minute because yeah. I also needed that pressure and it also stopped the overthinking. It was almost, it was like almost like a high to leave it to the last minute and then would go for it. But as I've got older, I don't have the energy to maintain that or to keep, to actually do the things last minute. So things didn't get done. Yeah. yeah that and has I, been the source of my frustration in the past couple of years, developed health conditions yes. where, cause I used to just leave things to the last minute. I, I, that's how I functioned. I needed the, that rush, that pressure to, um, get things done and I knew I'd be able to do it but the last few years I've still tried to do that and my energy and my focus just isn't at the same level mm. so it's become very frustrating I also totally identified with that um, getting older and not being able to do what I used to be able to do stay up all night and get something done I just it's impossible for me also I think taking on a something like a PhD it's impossible to leave it to the last minute. Although I think Chloe kind of did. <laughs> I don't know how they did it, but they're younger than me. Um, <laughs> I think they said they wrote their PhD um, in the last three months. Um, so we've got Liv Hanna, autism and ADHD keep, keep having an epic battle in mind between routine, novelty, order, mess, calmness, and movement. I think that is very um, a very good description of that. Um, it is. It feels like maybe one day you're maybe, say, more autistic, and then the next day you might be more ADHD. But then I also have days where I'm a bit of both and they just don't gel with each other. No. And I do feel as though I live in chaos. And when somebody kind of comes into my world, especially my work, or and tries to help me, then they they kind of jump into this chaos and they don't if they're autistic and not adhd they just don't get it at all like why have you just jumped why are you working on that i thought you were working on this and why have you stopped that and not finished it and started something else and why are you working you know <laughs> yeah, and they and just think, don't get yeah, it i hid so much of the chaos that i lived as well um I wouldn't let, I was, I was very, very ashamed because the things that I could do, couldn't do were like everyday things, which people found so easy and I didn't. So I, but it, and then when people did see their chaos, I was um, judged for it because it's like, but you're capable, but you can't do all these things. And people would try then desperately to get me back on track, but I couldn't ever maintain it. And then they would become really frustrated and it was like, and I never understood why. And I just, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, now that I understand that I'm an ADHD or as well as autistic, I'm like, well, that's how my brain works. You know, it, it makes connections very quickly. You know, my attention goes all over the place. And that also brings with it amazing creativity, amazing, you know, um, connections to things that other people just would not have. Um, it, it brings a lot of positive things as well. And I think, you know, I think that's really important to, to point out as well is that, you know, 
there's all amazing creative and awesome people here um, that, you know, make, you know, to a certain extent, we are who we are because of our being autistic and being ADHD years. That's when I find I seem to do my best work, which I, I've put into doing posts now, but I do still leave it till the last minute. When I've, <laughs> I've done it and people like it and I post it, I, I have no idea what I've done. I can't remember. People are asking questions. I'm like, I don't know. Stop asking me. But there's the post. Read it. <laughs> exactly. I have no idea I'm what so I've done. That. Yeah, I mean, I read back work that I've done for my PhD in writing and think, did I write that? I don't remember learning that. What? <laughs> um, yeah, and we just do it. Libby's got a couple of comments. If yes. You want to Sorry, do tell me because I, I obviously just noticed that the chat has not been moved down, so I've not seen them. So please do give me, where are we? Do you want to um, read them, Libby, or do you want someone else to read it? I can read them. Go on, eh? <laughs> Go on, Victoria. Um, Sorry, I'm totally lost. So as... <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks, Libby Simon. says, um, time means very little to me. I can't estimate how long things will take or how much time has passed, which makes it difficult to plan. And without external pressures, I stop doing the projects after the first steps and start something else instead. Yeah, and I think, yeah, Libby, you and I have talked about this before because um, I don't think in pictures, so, um, which I think, Victoria, you're similar. Um, Af Afant, and as well as Libby, is that not right? Is that, or do you think in pictures? Kind of little, yeah. But for me, yeah, I have no concept of time. Um, and when somebody says envision your calendar or, you know, I just, it's just black. I can't envision <laughs> schedule or how I would be able to, but yeah, um, no concept of time either. So yeah, it is very difficult within that to be able to um, organize yourself. Yeah, and that's interesting, you know, getting nervous about when to speak um, and your brain kind of going a mile a minute, but actually the conversation moves on before you get the kind of gumption to actually talk, um, which can be- but really I also need other people to be rigid with their time. So if there's a time that I'm supposed to have a call or something, say two o'clock, and they don't call or they're late, I will promptly have a meltdown. But I, me, myself, I don't have any concept of time. It... Yeah, and I think living, because um, my daughter as well is autistic ADHD and has, yeah, no concept of time either, so very little we sort of distract each other and go off on random tangents and yeah very little gets achieved but then again on the positive um the conversations and the randomness is hilarious to be honest and i wouldn't be without that energy and that experience i think it sort of brings a different dynamic to things yeah, and I think also I remember um, being uh, hosting a autistic uh, social group, and I, uh, Debbie was talking about you know an ADHD moment, and you know how they went upstairs to do one thing I think it was to get a tissue or something, and ended up like fixing a picture and hanging it on the wall or halfway hanging it on the wall, you know, and like going and getting a book and doing all these other things and then going back downstairs without the tissue. So, you know, <laughs> I, you know, I constantly am doing that throughout life, you know, um, but you end up doing things that um, do need to get done. In the yeah. <laughs> it's, like almost build, it's like building up a momentum. Yeah. But because your brain is firing off. You see this and that and that. And then, um, yeah, it's sort of, just builds up and builds up and then sort of lots of things get done on the way, but rarely the thing that you started with. Yeah. And, and, you know, I have to just say to myself, that's how my brain works. And if other people are distracted by that or other people are annoyed by that, there's not much I can do. That's just how I go about my life. <laughs> um, 
and you if have to find one, people. If there's one thing I need to do, then it will take a long time because I will do a little bit at a time, knowing that I'm just not going to focus on it or get distracted easily. So I'll just do maybe a few lines or a little bit of the picture here and there. Yeah, and, and that is the second thing that they, um, going back to that article um, by uh, I can't even say it, Michelle, Sarah on a classic, they say focus, focusing, sustaining and shifting attention to tasks. And I think for me, I focus on something, but I very quickly shift to other things and then I might go back to it. And that's, you know, I remember Chloe was saying, you know, Oh, Annette, you always say it takes you so long to get something done. And she's like, it's not that you're working on it the whole time. It's that you're distracted by 5 million other things that you have to do. Yeah. Um, and so it's like this kind of, you know, roundabout chaos map of how I get something done. Um, uh, and I five other need, things. I find I need helpful distraction, distractions, like body doubling or being on the Zoom. So you've got other people there, you've got them talking, you've got, you've got music but I will actually get some work done. Or if it's just me, then there's just no incentive to even look at it. Yeah. And it does take a long time, but I end up getting like five other things done that needed to get done that I've been avoiding as well. So, <laughs> I mean, I always think about it in relation to research as well. Like I love to research and I will go down a rabbit hole of research um, that, you know, I will look at 5 million things in relation to the thing that I'm researching, but I will learn a lot of, um, through that. And that makes kind of my understanding of something richer. And that is very kind of autistic, but I think in some ways, possibly it's interesting to think about that as uh, ADHD as well. Um, and that kind of jumping from attention to attention. And Libby has said something here. We've got Libby, there's a paradox of needing stimulation, but also really easily getting distracted from the main task. Yeah, definitely. I think it's really interesting. We're talking a lot about that walking in a tightrope or paradox or, you know, um, you know, the difference between calm and, and, and chaos um, as autistic people and ADHDers. That's quite interesting. Um, that keeps coming up. Yeah, so, and I think, you know, obviously it's interesting because a lot of what we're just talking about, um, focus, focusing, sustaining, and shifting attention is related to, related to autistic inertia as well. So there's lots of, you know, neurotypical, uh, neuro, neuro, neurological cousins um, in relation to ADHD and, and being autistic. And that is why it's quite hard to kind of unpick what is, and maybe we don't really have to to a certain extent, but it's quite interesting. <laughs> um, any, anything I else? Wonder with, I often wonder with the attention differences, whether it actually takes more effort and longer to get into that focus stream as well, um, because we're just going off at so many different tangents and that makes it um, quite difficult once in that and then once distracted not being able to then return to it again yes and I, and I whether that is the difference yeah, yeah. If i've got the perfect environment i can work very well and very quickly but if yeah. i'm not in the right environment then it's diff difficult yeah and i always say that that i can mon i can have a monotropic focus but it takes me a long time to get there and like you said, any distraction will take me out of it and it will be very difficult to back, get back in it again. So I used to create situations when I was younger where I would go, I'm an artist by trade. I would go to a painting studio. Luckily, I was the only person there. And I would paint for 13 hours straight throughout the night because I knew that once I got, I used to think, okay, it takes me four hours to get into a focus. And after those four hours, I was in the zone and I didn't want to get out of it. I could not do that now, <laughs> but that was how I kind of focused back then. Um, it had yeah. to be very specific, like uh, Sai was saying, you know, specific environment, very quiet. I was on my own. There was nothing else to do but paint. Um, yeah, there could be no dis no distractions and all the sort of traditional methods that you're taught 
um to you taught pacing yourself and do a bit of the chat I can't do that no um and when I look back and I think I used to get frustrated um with studying and things like that and put so many hours in but when I think about it so much of it was quite distracted or my head was in my thoughts but it looked as though I was working I was doing everything when in fact I was in another world pretty much yeah, and I think it's interesting to think about what I just described that was in the 1990s before cell phones. I could create an environment where there was no distractions. It's very difficult today to create an environment where there's no distractions. Um, I don't know about other, you know, oh, so we got Sai, Northern Naughty. ADHD and autistic experience comparison. It's like I have two conflicting personalities. One needs sameness, routine and order. The other needs spontaneity, stimulation and chaos, sometimes at the same time. I need a tidy workstation to be able to concentrate, yet I am unable to remain tidy for any length of time. I crave mental stimulation, but am easily overwhelmed. I'm often spontaneous, but if a plan or routine is changed by others, I shut down. I totally relate to all that side. <laughs> um, and it actually, it's not until I moved into somebody else's house that I've had a somewhat of a desk that's not totally covered with all my stuff just because I don't have very much stuff here. Um, it's interesting. And then we've got, um, and I don't know who said this because it's by, Chloe in the chat, but it's um, uh, the cruelty of getting dyslexic to read all the comments. Yes, <laughs> it is very cruel to get the dyslexic to read the comments. <laughs> so I said it was perfect. Don't judge. <laughs> I, yes, yes. Next time, let's have someone else read the comments. Okay, we've got Ben here again. I don't mind reading the comments. Do you want? Me okay, to Victoria, read? do read the comments. I don't mind being reading them wrong but uh, you get the gist right um but yeah go ahead, that it's yeah <laughs> just fucking empathetic now thinking oh no I'm <laughs> um, Ben says I feel in terms of attention both being autistic and ADHD can be an internal conflict as my autistic mind is monotropic and yet the ADHD part of me fights against it yeah, and I, I totally agree with that as well. So I've got that monotropic mindset, but it just takes me so long to get there. And it's so frustrating to me because I know I can do it. And I know when I do focus, you know, I can, you know, I can really be in that amazing zone, um, but it, it's finding a way to get there that can be really difficult. Uh, Sai says, tells the dyslexic to ignore parts of a sentence. <laughs> yeah, oh, I see. Yes, there's a conversation going on in the chat, which because I'm a, because of, I am all the things, everyone is kind of uh, <laughs> talking about me in the chat. And I'm just reading it because I'm, you know, I'm me. <laughs> so sorry, I'm like giving it all wrong, which is difficult. That's okay, right? I'm me. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go back to focusing. No, no, let's go on. I'm to beginning the third to thing. hate this. <laughs> <laughs> really serious. It's Chloe like is trying to herd all the a physical description. A bunch of cats. The, uh, oh, yes, I did think. Oh, gosh, I wish there was somebody on here that actually, you know. Okay, so three, what they talk about, um, third is effort. So, um, Regulating alertness, sustaining effort, and processing speeds. So I'd be interested to hear if anybody relates to this or... I'm trying to think about what regulating alertness means. Yeah. My autistic I'm... brain is looking at that and going... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think I'm like hyper alert because of anxiety. But then if I'm engrossed in something, like in a monotropic flow, then a bulldozer can come through the house and I wouldn't notice. Yeah. I'm trying to think of alertness. 
in relation to brain fog as well i mean i'm thinking about that and 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 how you know the older i get the more brain fog i have <laughs> um and you know being able to be alert and really focus is is you know it's more of something that i'm grasping at a lot more um i would say um processing speed for me is oh in relation you know for me is 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 quite long and detailed <laughs> um yeah it it's the it's the processing and it has got significantly slower as well yeah. and it's processing everything um and i also think um because i do now take medication as well um i can compare the differences between the moments when the sort of the medication is present the stimulants are there and when they're not so i now sort of realize how much you contend with um on a sort of everyday basis but my processing speed it take it sometimes it can take me weeks and months yeah. to process something yeah yeah definitely i totally agree with that um yeah in the past couple of years sustaining effort and processing speed has really declined sustaining effort i mean i need <clears throat> i need that to get into a monotropic flow to actually get things done but half an hour or an hour into something and I need to have a snooze or a break or just stop. And then it's difficult to get back into that flow. Yeah. And, and Chloe's kindly looked up Google uh, regulating alertness and it's basically the reticular um, activating system, which is about the senses. So that makes sense. Uh, um, you know, regulating our sensory experience, which is very, you know, once again, ADHD ears and autistic people, um, have that same experience of, you know, um, needing more stimulation or less stimulation and um, a different experience of the sensory world and how that affects us. I mean, I was thinking about conversation I had with, um, I actually went to Australia to a wedding and the bride and groom, I just met them and the bride, the groom was talking to me about my partner who I'd never met him before. It's the first time I was talking to him, but it was in a really loud restaurant, like incredibly loud. I had my loops in, but I took one out to hear him, but it took so much more time to actually process what he was saying. He was actually saying some kind of mean things about my partner, but it wasn't until like we got back from the holidays so two weeks later that I actually processed what he said and was really upset that I didn't defend my partner in that moment. Um, so I think for me, that makes total sense. And yeah. And Libby has said, I struggle maintaining attention and effort on tasks that provide no interest like paperwork. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. And gosh, yeah, B2 paperwork, uh, forms, um, anything to do with boring stuff like, <laughs> like or difficult yeah. things that I know I can get wrong, um, I struggle I with. Struggle, I struggle with forms for several reasons. But it just does not interest me whatsoever. So I can't even engage with it. Also with dyslexia and dysgraphia. I know I'm going to struggle with it, so I'm just like, why even waste the effort when I'm not going to be able to do it. Mm. Um, and Libby says, is alertness also in relation to danger linking to impulsivity? Yes. And I think um, that's quite interesting as well. Um, Cat B. Ott, I am able to focus on driving along a boring straight highway in low traffic if I'm also singing or talking. I totally relate to that. Um, also, I, I think about the times that I go into the kitchen to cook and it's much easier for me to cook if I've got um, something on my phone playing like Netflix or <laughs> um, a video or something. Um, that's easier for me than just trying to cook on my own. So that's kind of a need for regulating you, your sensory seeking at that moment. Aren't you? you need more than one thing going on. I used to drive to Cumbria quite often, every three months or so, but I can't do that anymore so 
the only times I can come is with my girlfriend because I just need uh, in the car, otherwise I'll just fall asleep. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Give it an hour and I'm dozing off. Yeah, and I think also I don't always notice everything because it's weird. I'm hyper alert in relation to me because I'm my sensory experience in the world. and But there's also times where I don't notice things that others do. Um, maybe when I'm in my brain fog or I'm trying to concentrate and I can't. Um, it's interesting. So the next one that she talks about is emotion. And I think we, before we even started, we, um, me and Victoria were like, yeah, um, managing um, frustration and um, modulating emotions. Yeah. Um, and that was what I didn't realize. Um, and it is the emotional sort of regulation. It's just, it's all or nothing with me. Um, that's a lot of the time what I sort of struggle with and the impact of that. And I think it makes sense to, if we're always kind of in a paradox, <laughs> um, walking on that tightrope to, to manage that frustration of, you know, you know. Are we all Alexa Primic here? I am, yeah. I am. Ben's um, I mean, I'm hyper empathetic as well as yeah. less climate, which is that they connect, you know, we were talking about that in another academy about how those things are related as well. Um, I was wondering yeah. if there's a connection between alexithymia and ADHD. Or maybe it's the, go ahead, sorry. I was going to say, because I'm hyper empathetic, but also alexithymic. So any form of emotion will be very strong. Also, I struggle to process and understand it. It can take me, again, it can take me weeks, even months to understand an emotion I've had. Yeah, I mean, I've started to identify it by physical reactions. So when I have a jaw ache, because I get TMJ and um, clench my teeth at, and grind my teeth at night, I know that I'm extremely anxious. Um, and usually I don't notice that until... I'm starting to feel a bit better. I've got to that point now, I'm 50. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I do really struggle with interception. I struggle with um, with my emotions and, and, and understanding and how to explain that to other people. Um, it has gotten a bit better with age, but um, it's still there. Yeah, I think it's also it's got better sort of understanding what's going on a bit more. Um, but see, my brain's gone blank now. As soon as we go to emotions, my brain just <laughs> cuts out and it's just, I find it, yeah. I think it is the frustration is sort of key. It's the frustration of having so much up in my head so much going on so much knowing <laughs> there's so much there and so little I can speak and communicate and that's and I thought for so long that it was because there was something really I was just not good enough I just could never do and now knowing that that wasn't the case and now understanding Part of it, that is a relief, but the other part is looking back and thinking, just what could I have done if I'd known <laughs> as well? So there is sort of a lot of frustration. Yeah, and I think I've spent a lot of my life confused. Yes. yes. And in situations where I didn't know what was going on, it might not have been you know, weeks until I kind of figured out and sometimes never <laughs> figured out what was going on. Um, and that is extremely frustrating and makes me sad, makes me want to, I, I mean, I'm so, my emotions are just right on the surface. I mean, if I think of something sad, it's, I'm just, I just start crying. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that for me, you know, 
can can be difficult sometimes, but it's quite beautiful to cry. <laughs> I cry out of happiness as well. Um, so you said, don't, okay, I can't remember. This, is this supposed to be in parentheses or not? Yeah, that should be in brackets. <laughs> <laughs> that should be in brackets. Okay, you guys are confusing me even more. Um, I know that Ben has done a really good um, on their site, which is Autisticality. Autistic. Yeah, Facebook um, page. Um, they've done a really good, uh, well, they've done lots of really good um, info graphics um, on, uh, in, in particular, um, rejection sensitivity. Um, um, which you all should go check out. And Libby says, confused is the only emotion I can easily identify. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it was quite hard for me to admit that a well, lot of my life I, I was confused. confused. As to what the confusion re is in reference to. <laughs> uh, I won't necessarily know why I'm confused. I'll just, but no, yeah, I'm confused. Um, yeah. I mean, I think in a neurotypical world with the sensory going on, um, it, it it makes total sense to me now looking back going, oh, I couldn't hear what anybody was saying. No wonder I was confused. But it's also about communication. It's about how we understand language, um, about processing speed, you know, um, about for me kind of modulating my emotions and like not allowing it to completely take over. Um, all sorts of different things. Okay, so we could talk about the next bit that they, they have on their list, which is memory, utilizing working memory and accessing recall. So how do we, ooh, ooh, we've got Ben here. I'll read this first, Ben says the experience of rejection sensitivity is an example of how emotions can flood through my mind, going from anxious to angry, to sad, to suicidal, to happy, possibly all within 10 minutes. It can be a real roller coaster. And that is so true, Ben. I think for me, a lot of times when somebody asks, you know, that whole question of, you know, how are you feeling or how are you doing today? you know you feel like 10 different emotions at one time and how do you describe that to somebody um it's like we need more words as you know autistic or dhders um of how to describe that emotion um you know how do you describe 10 different emotions at once yeah and people like want an event or to relate it to something and it's just like nope this is just so many things and yeah and it gets to the point where there's so many things going on that you just freeze to nothing sometimes yeah and I think the intensity of the emotion can be even in that 10 minutes that Ben was talking about can be quite extreme yes um, and it's those and people don't realize that it is those moments and the intensity of those moments it's just colossal yeah. That's why I seem to be in a constant state of confusion. Mm. There's all those strong emotions. I just don't know which which one I should be feeling. Yeah, and I think with me, because then you've got all the interception, the lexithymia and things like that, that often I don't get what's going on until it is very very intense and very it doesn't register until then and I don't know whether part of that is as Chloe said that alexithymia can be trauma related and that many of us have been sort of gasless and un misunderstood and have been trying to keep up for so long with things that you almost have suppressed it to the point of not being aware of it yeah, I mean, I, it was interesting. I was talking to somebody the other day, an autistic person, or I think possibly is ADHD as well, who um, talked about putting themselves in airplane mode, um, which I think of as autistic shutdown. Um, and, and you know, that, that ostrich with its head in the sand, um, that is, you know, me to the T. Sometimes I just can't handle the chaos um, and the confusion, and I just have to stop everything. 
Um, and that can be very frustrating for other people, but it's the only way I can deal with it. What are you going to say, Sai? That's what people would say to me, that I'm just sticking my head in the sand. But I was literally just trying to process life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and yeah, it's almost like... Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to stick people my head would, in the sand to be safe. Yeah. And people would say, yeah, would see the tasks that weren't being done. It's just simple. Just do it. Just do it. Now. It's just like you do not realise how much effort it takes to do that small thing. That you seem that seems so sort of easy for you, but for me, it is it has taken so long to do that, and nobody sees that effort. And, and they do don't see. Um, Go ahead, sir. When you do something, what they see is really difficult. They expect you to do the simple things. Yes. Which yeah, you whatever skills you've got, you, the difficult things for you they're simple, but for the other people that they see are difficult. Then they're not. Yeah, or you see kind of a way through to that difficult bit where they think, no, just just do this one thing. And you're like, no, I can't just do that one thing. That's not how my brain works. I have to do this, 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 and this, and I'll get mm. there. But you know, they're like, no, just focus, just get back to basics. And you're like, I can't, I can't get back to basics. It's not how my brain works. <laughs> um, and you know, your they don't almost, see the chaos that's going on yeah. inside of your brain either. And my brain almost needs the stimulation of the complexity <laughs> that mm. to distract, to do the very basic of things as well. Okay, I think Chloe is giving us a hint here that we should go on to memory, um, utilizing working memory and accessing recall. So how are we with memory? Um, mine's not great. <laughs> What was the question? Yeah, <laughs> if there, you know, if you if you live in chaos and uh, you are constantly confused, how? Yeah, memory is is a very interesting thing, isn't it? And it's for me, it's a little bit arbitrary because if I need to be in that moment of that interest, and if I'm not, then no, I'm not going to recall something. If it's relative to me, to me and interesting, then yeah, I'll, I'll info dump about it. I'll know everything. Yeah, definitely. And and you know, I I as a dyslexic person as well, and dyspraxic, uh, you know, games and things that have to do with memory, I'm absolutely horrendous ass, and I don't like playing. You know, even a wordly. I mean, I can't. I look at those letters on the page and they're just letters. They never I don't turn into understand words. What that is. <laughs> like, I've seen you people know, doing it. I just don't get it. I, you know, Sudoku, I can't. Yeah. For me, those things make me feel pretty rubbish about myself because I just can't do them. So I don't do them. <laughs> I'm at, I'm at peace with that. Um, I just say, no, I don't like games. <laughs> it's actually reading the instructions and remembering them to actually play the games in the first place. I can't yeah. feel. I just feel like it's like Russian roulette with my memory. I, work I never as well. actually, yeah, and never actually know what I'm ever going to recall um, or what is going to stick or what is going in. And that is why sort of education was so difficult because a lot of it was based on recall and my understanding was there but I couldn't remember the things to actually um, sort of hit the targets or whatever of what was needed and that was oh, and still is it's the work is incredibly frustrating and I yeah it's somewhat better now there is the advent of the internet because when I was studying everything, that wasn't there. Yeah, and Libby just says, if it's not in front of me, I forget it exists. Um, yeah. And I think I that's... Object and people permanence is really bad. Yeah, and that is so, so important um, as our, our ADHDers. You know, if we don't have things in front of us, we will forget about them. And, you know, that includes people, that includes deadlines, that includes appointments, that pretty much everything. Um, 
you know, we have to have that right in front of us and, 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 and that can be quite difficult. I think I had techniques when I was a student to memorize, but it was very short term. It was only for a test and then I would forget. So I usually do note cards with pictures on them and I write and the process of making the note cards would allow me to remember uh, things like art history. That's what I loved, but, but it was something I loved and it was something I was passionate about. Once again, if I'm not interested in it, it's not going to go in. Um, so I, Paige, I learn visually as well. So I, I, I need to see it done. And if yes. I can see it done, then I know how to do it. If I'm told or if I read it, it does not go in. I will have yes. to read it 10, 10, 20 times. I have to write it. Yeah, that, something that, physical that. has to be done. <laughs> and, and like you said, Sai, I think for me, doing it is the best way for me to learn yeah. something. Um, That's why I really I struggled at school because there was no or very little doing things. Yeah. Science yeah. I could do because I could do it. Um, in history, I would watch videos and things like that and TV and movies. So I learned history from that. But actual from textbooks. I couldn't. Yeah. And, you know, Pedro Carlos, is, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong again, I need to build an internal structure in my mind to keep the memories. And if I associate an emotion, ex emotional experience to it, the better. But there's no guarantee that I'll remember it. And that's quite interesting. You know, uh, for me, I don't see a picture. So building an internal structure, I suppose I could do that because I feel in my mind is about feeling. So I could possibly do that, but it'd be much more difficult, but that's really interesting. So the difference between thinking in pictures and not also relates to memory. Um, ben um, says, rage is at not being able to find something, which Ooh. turns out to be right in front of me. Oh yeah, Where's I'm good pain? at that. Oh, there it is. <laughs> um, oh, I found it. Yeah, yeah, I'm, and I'm interested because me and Sai and um, the older generation, Otty, <laughs> Uh, ought uh, DHD or so spoken about memory, I've but I'm interested. <laughs> I'm, you know, we've got Livy and Ben here or the younger generation, but, uh, you know, that's only in age and, and we're all um, of a great generation, no matter what age we are. Um, but just interesting in their experience of memory. Ah, so Libby said, I'm good at memorizing things I'm interested in, but will forget where I put the bowl of raw eggs when cooking. <laughs> That's a great, um, <laughs> great description there. You know, and you know, somebody's not a not ADHD would be like, how can you forget a bowl of raw? Uh, I don't know eggs. if it's memory or what it is, but I will put things in the wrong place. Like a few days ago, I put the um, packet of shreddies in the fridge. Hmm. Like, <laughs> obviously, yeah, it's the, long time. Time. Yeah. Why do you do that? the amount of cutlery that's gone in the bin over the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think, think um, what is the memory and think like the object permanence and particularly in relation to people is hard. Be and yeah, that is, and people get very offended when, because literally they're out of mind and then it's considered that you're cold, you don't care. And it's literally, it's not, or I've had sort of, um, when talking with people and family and even children, um, seeing that I'm not attending and that it has been taken as that I don't care and I'm not interested in them. And it's now it's like, no, desperately I am. I just can't sustain the, in oh, it sounds bad, the interest. I just can't keep the focus. No, I totally relate to that and you know you know not thinking in pictures as well i i can't recognize faces so when i see someone out of context i don't even recognize them so i could walk right past someone who's a very good friend um and not see them and and have gotten in trouble many times i have noticed that you know being friends with other neurodivergent people they usually get it you well, know it is actually because i just normally ignore them on purpose yeah <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, because, you know, if I forget about somebody, um, 
if I'm usually friends with a neurodivergent person, I, I, you know, they will understand that and just be like, you know, when we see each other again, it's like, ah, it's all, this, it's okay. Um, but yes, I've had many experiences and lost friends. Um, yes. Usually and not typical sort, friends. Yeah. And that sort of stopped me now connecting because I know that inevitably this will happen. So it, in my mind, it's just, no, I will just keep away because, um, it, it's a recurrent pattern but I think it is easier if the person is neurodivergent as well and and knows it I think that is sort of the key factor yeah yeah that's yeah and knows it and is accept themselves for who they am and accepts you for who you are because if they're neurodivergent and don't do that then they're just well, they're basically pretending to be a neurotypical anyway, so um, <laughs> they'll have the same reaction, uh, which is, um, you know, fascinating in itself. Um, okay, we could move on, unless anybody else has anything about memory, uh, to the last thing, which was action, monitoring and self-regulating -re action. And I think, I mean, that relates to focus and sustaining focus that relates to kind of activating to work as well, doesn't it? So it's quite interesting. Um, oh, okay, we got Beth here. If I had to focus on only one thing, it takes me at least twice as long to get it done. If I can listen to something at the same time, I can be really fast. I think I get lost in my thoughts when my auditory processing isn't occupied. That's interesting. I think that's very true. Sometimes I get lost in my emotions. Um, if, if I'm not occupied. Yeah. Um, so it's better to have that kind of, you know, more than one thing going on um, to be able to focus on something. That's I interesting. think that's why I use music a lot of the time. So I will use music if it's mundane tasks and things like that to get washing up done um, because that will distract almost the volume of thoughts in my head and stops the firing off of things and gives me the sort of stimulation I know and I also use it to sort of move on to different tasks yeah so maybe playing a different song depending on the task I, I, I do that yeah yeah so something that gets, gets me going if I have to hoover or, <laughs> or get out the door quickly get ready to get out the door um so Kate B says, unaware of risk, being rather blissfully unaware. Is that DHG? I think um, we talked about that a little bit. We talked about impulsive, impulsivity, um, but we could talk about that more because I think that's quite important. Um, and being unaware of risk. I think that's, it's, that's it's interesting. It's easy for me because I am sort of logically aware of the risk. It's like, yeah, I'm walking on this um, roof. If I fall off, I'll probably die. But I don't feel the risk as it is. It's like I'm comfortable in that place. I know the risks. I'm fully aware of them. I think it, part of me is overly aware. This is where it all gets very, very fleeting. And I think this is where you have almost the conflict because part of me is overly risk aware very aware because of the overthink and heightened and then the other part of me is just I won't swear it's just sod it what the hell go for it and it's the and it's those flashes and that has what has sort of created a lot of um very poor decision making yeah I mean I think but the autistic side has almost been a protective factor in that I think for me, I look back at a lot of the decisions, poor decision making in relation to money, in relation to career, in relation to people um, that I allowed to be in my life. Um, I took a lot of, you know, drug taking, uh, all sorts of things. I took a lot of risks that other people would not take. But at the, I don't know, it's at the, I feel the same, Victoria. And I think the older I get, the more I'm aware of all the things <laughs> that could go wrong that maybe when I was younger, I wasn't aware of those things um, that stops me from doing things sometimes, which is, is 
is kind of the opposite of, I mean, I mean, I always kind of look back as when I'm younger and think, oh, I just didn't know that anything would go wrong. So I just did anything, you know, it was okay. Everything was going to be okay. Um, uh, yes. Yeah, so we got Libby says, I think my brain recognizes the risk, but sometimes moves on too quickly to act on it. That's quite interesting. So yes, you might I feel and see the physical dangers. Like I used to mountain bike a lot. I would go down very steep hills and everyone thought I had a death wish. But to me, I, I could almost, um, I'm hyperfant as well. So I can, and patterns, I can pattern so you can see the dangers and so I can avoid them. Whereas I, I see more dangers in leaving the house and going shopping because that is the anxiety. I can see the anxiety in that and the danger from interacting with people and, you know, the rejection sensitivity. But flying down the mountain on a bike, I can do that. And it's, it's interesting because now that I'm, I know I'm autistic and I know that I'm ADHD -er, it's different when I didn't know that, when I had no awareness of who I am and how, how I relate to the world. I was confused a lot of the time. So I think some of my impulsiveness or some of my kind of risk taking just had to do with my confusion and just wanting to do something, yes. I suppose. Yeah, <laughs> wanting to make a decision and just being like, yes, because, you know, if I didn't do that, I wasn't going to do anything. Um, and sometimes it was because, and a lot of it was, like, I just want this torture, this over with, I just need to do it and make that happen and forget the consequences because it was that stressful trying to actually make that decision. <laughs> And I used to think that I was, you know, didn't like structure. And I used to think that I was this impulsive person that liked to be a free spirit. And, you know, I'll move from the US to the UK and not know anyone and I'll be okay with that. But it was the only way I could kind of come, I kind of feel like I, what's the word, catapult? Catapult myself into a new life. It was like, it was the only way I could like get myself think, to do something. Yeah. I think I was the opposite. I was so, nobody would know the sort of the level of chaos and impulsivity and what I was desperately trying to control because I was so controlled and it took so much energy. Um, but I wanted to have that that sort of just do it, that impulsivity and that freedom, but didn't. So it's sort of the opposite. A lot of my impulsivity is very restrained. Yes. Like, um, it doesn't want to be. <laughs> Oh, there's a window open. Jump out of it. <laughs> like, you know that's going to hurt. But my brain is still telling me, jump out the window. Not yeah. because I want to hurt myself, but just my brain is telling me to be impulsive. Yeah, and we've and got... Uh, oh, go ahead, sir. Dr. Chloe Farah huh, has said... Yes. Yeah, it's the hunt for the dopamine. I was trying to think... I was trying to think of the word earlier, and I couldn't remember it. And, yeah, I do have a bit of a need for dopamine Definitely. I need that, that hit but I also get the the dopamine crash afterwards so it's, yeah. it's either high or low it's, it's never really a what in the middle I think for me sport is a big big part of that and I grew up in a family I think that we're also autistic and ADHD um, so skiing um, snowboarding um, you know any all sort all sorts of sports you know that 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 was something that for me was helped my mood but also um was something i needed um for for that intensity ever hunt the, for the dopamine food i kind of tell the story of myself in my 20s where we went to <laughs> buffets i cannot do buffets because when I see a buffet, I want to eat everything on the buffet. And when I was young, I used to go to the dessert counter first. Um, and I've made myself incredibly ill many times <laughs> because I could just eat all those desserts. I don't do that as much anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I find buffets incredibly difficult. It's almost like everyone's going to eat the food and I'm never going to have food again. But I have to have um, as much food as I possibly can. <laughs>
<laughs> and I don't know if that's part of ADHD or uh, I, it feels like it is. It's that impulsivity. It's that hunt for like new sensation. Yeah, sometimes winter, like the sugar hit in itself, is that a stimulant as well, going for that sugar. And that is something that I have noticed since having the medication, that sugar need, voracious need for those has gone down a lot of the time. And I do wonder. Mm. And, let's see, and Stephen really hits home for me, literally, because I'm at home in Cumbria. <laughs> I solved Northern Artist's problem. I moved to Cumbria, Ambleside, six months ago, and I'm loving it. Sensory seeking heaven, it is. But also, sense, your sensory avoidant is very good here as well. There's no way I would be able to do the journey if it weren't out, outside the front door. Because that where I live in Dover, there's too much sensory stimulation. There's noise of the traffic, there's people, it's very chaotic. But in Cumbria, it's very peaceful, but you can also go kayaking on the lake, go, um, go, go on a zip line, you can go, um, what's the word, when you go down the rocks? Um, Absail. Absailing. Yeah. go mountain biking, you've got all those activities to get your dopamine fix. And then you've got the peaceful side to chill out when mm. your dopamine flows. So yeah, it is, I've, I do miss Cumbria. In the past few years, I've been really trying to find a way to get back here. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, I think I did. I found the South very, um, it was too much but in the wrong way too much, the wrong sort of stimulation, whereas yeah. moving, it is the visual stimulation I sort of need. So you've got the complexity of the, but it's a naturalness to it. And I think that's the difference. I think also for me, I, I was trying to explain why I find it hard to cycle sometimes on roads, um, where it's much easier for me to cycle in the woods. So I need yeah. kind of calm when I'm doing these when I'm doing these exercises in the hunt for dopamine, because I, I need to concentrate, I need to focus. Um, and if there's too much else going on around me, um, I don't trust myself not to lose my focus for a minute and get hit by a car. Um, and I have better days, you know, where I'm really dyspraxic, where I'm not doing very well. So I kind of think, okay, I'm not going to get on my bike today because I know that <laughs> who knows what's going to happen. Um, so we've got, Chloe said there's a connection between ADHD regulation and sub substance use and addiction, um, which is very clear. Um, Libby, I'm going to, yes, uh, Libby says either decisions take me forever and then I end up asking someone else to make them or I make the decision in a split sec second and regret it later. Um, I totally agree with that. Sometimes when I ask somebody else to make a decision for me, and they make a decision, I say, no, I want to do the other thing because it's them saying it and me going, oh, I don't want to do that thing <laughs> that I realize what I actually want to do. Um, and Libby's just said impulsive shopping. Yes, big time. Um, um, yeah, I have wait. trouble with that with also the impulsive need to craft. Um, and, uh, <laughs> But uh, never actually do them. Yeah, I'll be interested in something. Oh, I'll be able to do that. I'll buy all the things that I need and then I'll shove them in this drawer and never see them again. Because I can't I... get started on them or I can't yeah. concentrate to read the instructions and oh. And I think there's I, I I think there's a Facebook group somewhere of a bunch of people like that that have done, you know, crafters that have bought all this stuff that want to trade. It's like I've got all the stuff to do right now. Um, I've got all the stuff to do, uh, Japanese mending of jeans, um, but I've never done it. <laughs> so I could trade that with someone else to do a different craft that I actually might want to do. Oh, awesome. yes. Yeah, I can't even remember the name of it. Um, yeah, but I think impulsive shopping, just for me, money in particular, has been a real difficulty throughout my life. And I've really struggled with, um, the impulsivity of shopping and buying things that I don't need. Um, but also, you know, man, not managing my money. Well, um, yeah, Ben is says here impulse to start a new exciting hobby only to forget about it after a week and moving on to the next thing. Yeah, definitely. Um, well then, or then 
wanting to actually do it but can't remember where all the stuff is and then having to go and buy it again. <laughs> and then you find and the stuff after you've bought it again. And then you find it. <laughs> You, you, you've got the stuff, you want to do it, but your workstation is, is a mess and you can't focus while it's a mess, so it never gets started. Yeah, and you've yeah. got to grab that moment. It's almost when you have that moment where you know that this is the possibility, this is the moment, the opportunity, and you can't find the stuff and it goes. So this is Pedro. It says, that's, that's answered me. I'm not ADHD. I want a risk-free life, very predictable, monotonous routines, restricted to healthy foods in small amounts. And I think a lot before deciding and I'll stick to the decision. Wow. Yeah. That doesn't sound like <laughs> you're on ADHD. <laughs> Definitely. I would like those things, but it doesn't happen. <laughs> I aspire to that. <laughs> I do aspire to that. Um, I, I do want that, but also I know when I have moments like that, I end up overthinking and overprocessing. So that's when I need the impulsivity. Yeah, uh, Chloe says the ready salted autistic like me, uh, definitely. And I think uh, for me, uh, uh, Chloe just reminded me of a dice idea that I had, which was related to what I was saying to Libby. But um, sometimes, if you can't make a decision, I I roll the dice that just says yes or no, or I can decide what. Um, and I've tried it, that, but I'm like, no, don't tell me what to do. Yeah, but then at least you make a decision. It tells you what to yeah, do, and you know, I want to do the other thing, and that's fine. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah. Right. It's like my life I'm, will not be ruled by a dice. Yeah. So that's I, I demand of what I needed to do, yeah. and I put it in a jar, and I pick it out. I was like, no, don't want to do that. No, don't want to do that. No, don't want to do that. Yeah, it was like the Apple Watch. Get an Apple Watch. This will be the answer to it. And it's like, no, that watch will not tell me when to breathe or stand up. No. Yeah. <laughs> and that that is, you know, that interconnectedness as well with demand avoidance or PDA um, and being autistic and or and ADHD as well is really interesting. You know, I think for me, I definitely a demand avoidant, probably not to the extent that um other people are um but and i've i've made decisions in my life just based on the fact that i didn't want to do what other people wanted me to do um not on that i actually want, <laughs> wanted to do that thing um you know i chose at university to learn swahili um because i had to learn language and i wasn't going to learn a language that everybody else did <laughs> I had, and I don't remember any of it. I don't remember. I didn't use it. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I, I chose that. And I kind of think of that as an example of my demand avoidance. Um, Callum says, this really opens my mind to the potential of me being an ADHD or ha ha. I do feel like there's a strong overlap with the autistic and ADHD identity though. And I'm sorry if you've discovered some key distinctions that I've missed. No, I think I think you're right. And, and that's the whole idea is that we're neurotypical, we're neurological cousins. So there's so, it's really hard to unpick and, and deciding, um, you know, what is the autistic part of you and what is the ADHD part of you. Um, and there is a lot of um, overlay in the experience of being autistic and the experience of, um, of um, being an ADHD. -er. And I think Possibly, you know, we're not experts. So do watch the uh, session, Academy session on the 31st of August um, with the panel that kind of really is going to break down, um, you know, what it means to be an ADHD. -er. I'm going to break down. <laughs> And uh, we've got, <laughs> and we've got uh, Ben has says, um, always ask for opinions on decisions only to ignore them because I ultimately don't want to do what someone else is telling me I should do, even though I asked them to tell me what to do. Um, I yeah. get that as well, definitely. And, and that is then, the difficulty, not being able to make a decision, asking other people to help you, but then being like, I can't take that on. Something aligns <laughs> with what I really want to do and I'm focused on doing then yeah I will take that suggestion but if it's something I know that I'm not going to do I'm like yeah thanks for that but I'm not going to do it I don't this is where having heavily masked and this is where um, there's almost a total conflict because 
I have masked and I have been so compliant, but underneath it, there is this undercurrent of objecting to it and all of these things and that constant battle at times has sort of almost made me ill and rent because being so compliant all the time has gone actually against my nature. Yeah. It's, it's just a constant conflict and I think people don't realise sort of fawning and that is why it isn't recognised so much. Yeah, and I'm a people pleaser as well, so spent a lot of my time trying to figure out what other people want and yes. give them that. And so it didn't give me a lot of time to figure out what I wanted, but maybe that was an escape from the chaos in my own brain, um, from my my own indecision. Um, it's interesting. Uh, Wayne Abbott says, I am already diagnosed as autistic. Is there any advantage to getting a diagnosis um, for ADHD? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say I self-diagnose and that is enough for me. Um, I would say we could talk to Victoria and Libby about the advantages. I think if you want to take drugs to help with your ADHD, obviously that is going to be an advantage. Um, am I going to feel like... Yeah, I'm no, it's basically um, she's asking the same question. <laughs> Meds? Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that was something I was always dead set against, having sort of being over-medicated and inappropriately medicated all over my life. I was dead set against it. Um, but that was when I talked with people um, and I, in the end, took the decision probably impulsively <laughs> but um to try it but I did actually speak with someone who was a professional and was also did have um attention differences and when it was explained what and this is per difference it would not made I decided to try it um and I did and it has it's not an answer because it's part of many different things um and it doesn't stop it because once that medication it's artificially doing it but um i now notice say on a morning before the medication how massively um overactive my thoughts are and it's only in that comparison of having had the medication and it turning down the volume it didn't turn me into this super focused human being it doesn't it just brings the volume down and that's when i notice when the levels are not right um and the volume and it comes back it's hard that's but i now notice the difference it has made it's not life changing it just makes life a bit easier that's interesting. Yeah. And Libby says, um, I see meds as an aid. I enjoy my brain on them and off them because it gives me different strengths. Off meds, I am more creative, etc. And odd meds, on meds, I can better reach deadlines. I personally enjoy both states of mind, which I think is quite interesting that you can... Um, does, it yeah. come, does it go out of your system quite quickly? So that's that's possible to kind of be on and off... It depends on the type of medication that you, you take. Some of them are short acting. So they, and it also depends on your metabolism and things like that. And others um, will, they give a longer, more sustained, and you have to keep taking them. But it all depends on you as an individual. Um, and that's why um, it's quite important. It's sort of monitored as well to find out what suits and sometimes it doesn't and there are stimulants and the non-stimulants that it's but it is very individual but i agree with um libby it isn't it is an aid it's one of many things what were you going to say si i can't remember <laughs> Okay, we'll come back to you if you. Olivia's uh, got says uh, also it's amazing experiencing quiet mind when you have only experienced the last um, the fast one without knowing 
I think that's interesting to experience a quiet mind. I guess I've never experienced that. Um, Ben says, the struggle to focus and follow through on getting a diagnosis for ADHD feels worthy of a diagnosis in itself. <laughs> um, being ADHD is making it hard to get assessed, which I find ironic, especially as I said, I was going to ask um, GP for assessment over a year ago now and have yet to ask about it. <laughs> um, yeah, I do get that too, Ben. <laughs> It does take us a long time to get things done. Um, yeah, I, I'm not diagnosed, but it's something I really do want to look into. Um, but yeah, being ADHD has made getting a diagnosis difficult because it literally, if it's not on my mind, like in 10 minutes, I will have forgotten about it. So, and then when it is on my mind, I'm not in the flow to actually do anything about it. So I won't go online. I won't look into getting an assessment or talk to a doctor. So I haven't done anything about it for over a year. Yeah, it's that object permanence, isn't it? Or, you know, <laughs> you're in so much chaos. It's like, oh, oh yeah, I need to do that, that thing. I'll put that ask, on a list. <laughs> I want to ask, do the meds help with intrusive thoughts? Because I know you said they calm your thoughts and they calm your brain. But do they... Calm the intrusive thoughts. Um, in certain respects, yes, and others, no, because um, when I have found that it has calmed my brain and the volume of thoughts, it has also meant that I have been able to process things that previously I couldn't process. Um, and sort of almost the PTSD and things has come more to the forefront as well. So no, in that respect, mm. it hasn't, but what it has taken away is the impulse, sort of the impulsivity, the impulsive actions more, which I think is of benefit. Because yeah. the reason I want to look into it is at this stage, primarily look into medication because I, I think I will um, feel and be better if I can just focus for once and not have so many thoughts going on at the same time. Yeah, I mean, Libby, it's interesting because Libby says it's very strange. Wait, other people think like this? It's so slow, quiet. Um, Victoria's I, I just said. I can't even imagine having a quiet mind. Yeah, Libby's got a hand up. Sorry. Oh, yes, Libby. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, I was going to add to that with, I find, so I take uh, Ritalin. Um, so you can only, you can take it for short periods and like whenever you want, um, which is what I like, because I would have liked to completely change or like turn off ADHD, whatever that means. Um, but I do find I have to be careful what I'm focusing on when it kicks in, otherwise I can lock on to the wrong thing. And I, I so I lock on to the wrong task, but I could also lock on to the wrong thought process. Because the normal, like my normal brain is, it's almost like a spider web or tree of thoughts. When I take the medication, it goes down to like one thought after the other. And so you get stuck with one process. So I find I, I always have to be careful of what state of mind I'm already in when I take them or where I am, what task I'm trying to do. Because it, it, yeah, it's tricky if you lock on to the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And that kind of, I don't know how I made a connection there with the fact that all of us are kind of quiet ADHDers to a certain extent, that we're not, we don't over verbalize. Um, and that, you know, we talked before we started this session about, you know, our experience of other people who may be more ADHD than autistic. Um, which That's why yeah. I've never even thought about being ADHD until the past couple of years, because I'm not a hyperactive type. My brain is. But outwardly, I'm not hyperactive. In certain situations, I can be. 
like I will have a hyper day or so. I'm just running around the house doing hyper things for no reason. But generally, and I thought, it's all in my head. Yeah, yeah. And Victoria, you were saying um, that, you know, we we can, you could hear everything, well, you can say it, but you can hear everything you, that you can follow them to a certain extent. So follow the connections and follow that kind of massive web of what they're talking about. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I, although I'm verbally, I'm, I, I'm a lot slower than I used to be. I didn't always, my speech wasn't always as slow as it is. This is sort of age and other factors. But I actually enjoy, when people are hyperverbal, it's a very different form of community. And I quite like the energy of it. Um, I can sort of, I won't remember it, but I enjoy that communicate. I love that randomness, the flow and the energy. And that is very, very different to some sort of neurotypical where I can't follow it at all. It isn't natural to me. Mm, um, mm. And it's a very different sort of energy. Yeah, and I can definitely say the same thing that I really appreciate it and kind of in awe a lot of times when I'm talking to somebody who has that more ADHD kind of thought process and it's all there, you know, it's like this massive tree of connections and, um, you know, I get lost in their conversation. Um, and like you say, much easier to understand than a neurotypical conversation. Um, oh, interesting. Mm. Neurodivergent conversations are more interesting. Yeah. So they're easy to follow because you're interested in it. Yeah. Um, and even if there is a massive change of topic, you kind of you see, or, really, or we just accept it, I suppose, in other ways, um, which is quite interesting. And uh, yes, so I think this is a good place to stop for now. I know that we're going to be discussing ADHD again um, on the 31st, like I said. Um, and there will be a proper panel of experts um, on the 31st kind of talking about what the DSM says ADHD is and what kind of um, what is the, pers the perspective of living in that and, and experiencing um, ADHD. So yeah, do tune in for that. Next week, we have Dr. Benjamin Mitchell dis discussing a brief history of neurodivergences, um, the hexadox and the occult. It sounds very interesting. You'd have to tune in to figure out what that is. Uh, but we always end the session asking people what their favorite STEM is or your current favorite new stim um and i'm just wondering if anybody wants to talk about their their favorite stim right now doodling doodling i love doodling it, it's it's yeah it's gone but it's returned in absolute <laughs> oh my god things digitally everything um paper everywhere is covered in doodles <laughs> Oh, fabulous. I mean, I, I got so into doodles as an artist that I actually, when I taught painting, that was one of their assignments was to turn one of their doodles into a massive painting. Um, because I think doodles are amazing and so incredibly creative. And, you know, people dismiss them a lot, but actually, you know, they can, they're very much art, I think, and can be made into art as well. Um, yeah, I'm all about the doodle. Awesome. And it so helps me concentrate. Like, for me to doodle and listen to someone means that I actually understand what somebody is saying to me. Um, and that's been really helpful for me as a student. Um, let's see, so we've got Ben. I got a new long dinosaur plushie. Ooh, that sounds awesome. Which I have been cuddling a lot since I got it yesterday. Really soft and spikes on its back feels tingly against my palms, which is nice. Oh, I love it. <laughs> So you, you need to name it after me then, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I call it Cy. <laughs> <coughs> okay, anyone else? What is your favorite stem right now or your new stem? I don't know if it's stem or new dedicated interest or a combination of the two, but I'm enjoying making the posts. Um, 
doing the images and the right the writing with it. it has yeah, its and I've, this, but I'm enjoying it. Yeah, and I've heard very good things. Chloe was telling me the other day and showing me what you've been doing, both you and Ben. Um, yeah, does Libby have a favorite stim they want to share with us? Or if not, they can pass, as we always say. <laughs> you can pass. Um, I can't really think of a new one at the moment. I think I'm just trying to think for me, um, because I've been away and in like neurotypical land in Australia, spending time with lots of neurotypicals on a regular basis, what I've been doing to kind of focus. And I think it's probably my spinny ring still. Um, I bought a new one, which actually says on it, um, you are enough, which I quite like, because it just reminds me every day that I'm enough. Um, and I do notice when I forget to put this on in the morning and I go out of the house without it, it's, it's uh, a bit, well, there's a bit of anxiety around that. <laughs> so I do love this. Um, it, uh, it stops me from biting my nails as much as well, or my cuticles, um, which is quite nice. Um, uh, yeah, and it's just something I have with me all the time. And Wayne Atwood says, the knee giggle is my most dominant stim. Okay. Knee What's a knee giggle? Jiggle. Knee jiggle. Knee jiggle. Knee jiggle. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's what I've, I've been doing that for the last two hours. It hasn't stopped my leg. <laughs> Fabulous. And I'm doing it right now because I just was remembering it. And now I'm like, yes, I have to do that. Uh, Pedro, my stem is moving my fingers, um, passing the top of my thumb on the other finger tops, starting on the small finger. Okay. Did, I probably read that totally wrong, but it sounds like. Passing the top of my thumb on the other fingers. Oh, yes, the tops. Okay. So like that. Oh, you think, oh, yeah. Oh, there's all sorts of finger things. things. I do this, actually, a lot. Like what I do, yeah. probably. Chloe does that. Yeah? Yeah, I That's do. That's quite nice. Well, yeah. when I'm actually anxious and stressed, I do that. I do the Finger crap. stuff. Okay. And final, final question. What is your favorite form of potato? Um, anybody? want to venture I, do you want me to read that yes <laughs> <laughs> i just ah yeah okay. I that. go victoria no i can see it's a little locked yeah. <laughs> right. Libby, um, where are you? you know when it's one <laughs> me stop it you know when it's 1am and even though you've eaten pretty much everything in the house because today was just i'm super hungry day so you creep downstairs in the dark that's the octopus creeping downstairs <laughs> standing on the damn squeaky ball the dog left at the bottom the same dog now thinks you're an intruder and chases you around the kitchen for you to narrowly escape back upstairs into the safety of your bedroom. Sweating, heart racing, even hungrier, you remember that package of cheese and onion hula hoops under the bed. Bed, I have a ceiling bed, oh yes. Oh, good. Heart racing, even hungrier, you remember the packet of cheese, onion hula hoops under the bed so that... So you swat around, dodging the lost stocks, lost socks, stim toys and fluff, eventually finding what now seems like the holy grail of confectionery, the great and wonderful <laughs> only packet of hula hoops left in existence only to find it contains nothing but empty chocolate wrappers. Yeah, not one. <laughs> That is fabulous. <laughs> After all that, I messed it up. It should have said not that one. <laughs> and Wayne Abbott Atwood have said chips with may mayonnaise. Oh, that's a good compromise. That is no, a good compromise. Never. Yes, chips, chips is my favorite pepper. form of potato. Um, I'm 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 more of a garlic mayo person. I think I have to say, um, but that gets us into another realm. So form of form of potato quickly. So we can go because it is almost nine o'clock and we've done the, of course, because we're off, off ADHD years, um, it's gone on forever. <laughs> then it's my second favorite form of potato. Okay. Libby. No pressure. 
I just want to see the octopus again. <laughs> it is good. What about you, Victoria? Favorite form of potato? Potato waffles. Potato waffles. Libby says, I don't get potatoes. Mum has a phobia. Oh, no potatoes. I have to say my partner doesn't like potatoes because they're carb disaster. So I don't get very many potatoes either. But you have uh, been. Okay. And Dr. Chloe says, I mean, technically Sai's comment was not their favorite. I, I'm so confused. Yeah, she said you said your second What's favorite it? potato. So what is your first favorite potato, Sai? I'll never reveal that. And you'll never reveal that. Okay, I think that have we oh, asked no, Ben what their the form fact. of potato is? Yeah. Fact <laughs> of the week. The animal on the Firefox logo is not a fox, but a red panda. Ooh. That is a good fact of the week. Okay, I think we can probably end there. Is that safe to say, everyone? <laughs> because we're just going to go on forever. Potato is himself. Oh, okay, fabulous. Thank you, everyone. Amazing. Thanks, Wayne. You're amazing. Um, and thanks for being here and, and putting up with us ADHD years. Um, bye. And thank you so much for coming. And yes, once again, Dr. Benjamin Mitchell next week discussing neurodivergences and the heterodox and the occult probably mispronounced that it sounds amazing we'll have to find out next week thank you bye